Uh, now it uh, it my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Russell Luke. Uh, he is currently uh, a professor of um, continuous optimization and its application uh, at the University of Göttingen uh, in Germany. Uh, previously, he um, uh, he received uh, his uh, PhD in applied mathematics uh, from the University of Washington uh, in uh, 2001. Uh, it's mean uh, 20 years ago. Uh, he is an uh, international uh, expert in optimization, and today uh, he uh, he will talk about uh, structure, uh, non-convex optimization, local and global analysis. Uh, Okay. Can can you try sale then? My my is can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Oh, you can. Okay. I wasn't yeah. sure if, if you can hear me. Okay. Then I will share my screen. Yes. Uh just a moment. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh Thanks, Min, um, and um, hello, everyone. It's nice to see uh, so many old friends uh, here. Uh, and um, the time warp is still, <laughs> still problematic for me. Um, but what, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, since I have um, I've really uh, belabored uh, some other work, with particularly with the Australian community, uh, I was <clears throat> determined to present something new uh, this time. And so this is work that I've been doing with Sholm Sabach and Mark Taboul and students Eyal Cohen and Titus Pinter. Uh, Titus is with me in Göttingen and Eyal is with Sholm in, uh, in Haifa. Um, and um, our, our goal, overriding goal is to bring together the global analysis uh, that is Mark and Shom's specialty together with, with my uh, specialty in local analysis so we can get a complete picture of convergence of algorithms for non-convex and non-smooth problems. So we're looking at problems with, with this kind of structure. Um, we're going to start with something very, very concrete and just sort of see how things uh, work out in, in this context. So uh, we've got uh, a function, this f of x, this is just going to be proper and lower semi-continuous. <clears throat> um, the uh, phi of y is convex, uh, proper and lower semi-continuous. And then there's this uh, coupling function, q that couples the variables x and y. And this will take a quadratic form uh, down here. Uh, the, however, we, the, the um, mapping on x, so y is going to be some m-dimensional variable, and x is an n-dimensional variable. And the mapping q, little q, is also going to be con uh, quadratic, but not assumed to be convex. So, um, so we have a quadratic coupling here that's not necessarily a convex type of quadratic coupling. <clears throat> uh, and then this, this row, this is just a parameter, the, the pen penalty parameter uh, in a sense. Um, and, and again, right, this little q. In general, it's just a C1 function, but uh, when we get into specifics, it's going to turn out to be a, a quadratic function. Um, and this generalizes a lot of, a lot of um, uh, specific problems, in particular, non-convex least squares regularization. Uh, so the, there's a linear mapping acting on X. <clears throat> so in uh, this, this works when you have constraints in the image space of some lin linear mapping that you want to apply, and that's the, that happens quite quite frequently. Um, also, uh, non-convex constrained optimization. We we insist that the that the variables y uh, stay in some convex set. And this convex set is just going to be, say, the, the uh, negative orthonth or something like this. <clears throat> uh, but the, the mapping to, to those y variables is going to be uh, non-convex in general. 
Um, and this also you can you can formulate uh, phase retrieval in this uh, in this format. Uh, again, you have um, you'll have this um, this is our quadratic type mapping on the on the x variables and the y variables will just be constrained to again some uh, some simple set in the image uh, of these mappings uh, f here. Um, so and then I'll, my notation for the indicator function is is the iota here. Other people use delta, um, and uh, so a, a kind of background slide here. I, I use this slide frequently in a lot of different contexts just to make clear um, uh, where I'm uh, heading and, and sort of what my focus is really. So. Um, when you approach things the way uh, Mark and Shalom approach things, they're thinking about optimization problems. So their analysis is really um, focused on the properties of the objective function f and, and maybe the, the constraint set uh, uh, omega, which then we can just all put into the objective function with an indicator function. So it's just, you know, everything kind of derives from the, the structure of these functions in the context of, of optimization. But when we go down to algorithms, um, basically, so we look at first order optimality criterion, which um, Patrick was just talking about, criticality of points. So we want to solve these kinds of generalized inclusions. Um, and then when we go from solving generalized inclusions, we, uh, we uh, reformulate that as, as a fixed point problem. That's either finding the zeros of this operator or finding the fixed points of, of uh, a related fixed point operator here. And then we go to algorithms. We have a, and uh, now this is where maybe my perspective diverges a little bit um, because there's, there's a whole lot of technology um, in accelerating um, things and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's maybe not always obvious uh, or even possible to formulate your algorithm as a fixed point iteration. But I've gotten very good at, at doing that. And um, in the follow-up to, to this talk, I'm gonna show how, how I do that for this particular problem. Um, but anyway, this is my perspective down here as just fixed point theory. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of where I meet uh, Mark and show him. Um, but it's a, there's a you know a very interesting uh, question that needs to be asked once you uh, once you set up a fixed point iteration and you presumably find fixed points and some limits. Well, do those fixed points have anything to do with the original problem you were you were faced with? And and um, you know when when f is convex and the omega is a convex set and we're in linear spaces then. The correspondence back up this chain of implications is is fairly uh, expected, let's say. Um, uh, but it's it gets interesting when f is not convex uh, or omega is not convex, and we're in say non-Euclidean spaces. So um, and that's happening more and more uh, frequently in in the applications that I'm looking at. And the other point is that. Um, and I say this frequently, you know, I'm working with physicists and they're uh, very good at coding things. And they usually just set up some fixed point iteration formally and just let their computers run until iterates don't change anymore. And then that's the solution to their problem. And whether that has anything to do with some optimization problem is uh, sometimes and not infrequently for them completely irrelevant. Uh, they look at the point that the computer gives them, and if they can physically interpret it, then that's that's great. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about you know uh, the making uh, this connection again back to some variational problem that you think you might have uh, been trying to solve. Um, another thing, which to this crowd will be um, this is totally ordinary, but but this gets to uh, my point about. Uh, sometimes fixed point iterations, the fixed point iteration formulation is not always obvious um, because accelerations, which are a huge industry uh, in, in 
numerical optimization at the moment don't often fit into this fixed point format. You can't explain why or how accelerations accelerate algorithms. Um, so again, here's my fixed point iteration. An acceleration might look like something like this. Um, and I use this fancy uh, circle plus notation to, to just generalize that idea to non-Euclidean spaces where you don't necessarily have addition uh, between points. Um, but even if you're concerned with, with accelerations, um, your, your, main, your main operator of, of interest is going to be some convex combination of descent mappings and resolvents and compositions of these things. So for instance, you know, your, your, your main operator might look something like, like this, you know, a convex combination of, of a resolvent mapping R uh, and, and then the specific case of the optimization problem that I started with, minimizing F subject to being in this set omega, the resolvent operator could be this, which would be the projector onto that, onto that set. Um, and, and then a, a, some sort of uh, relaxation of a gradient mapping or a, a descent mapping. And so G would be the, the, the gradient of F. And so, you know, and, and we imagine algorithms just kind of putting these things together in, in a clever way that, that, gives us, that gives us the convergence uh, that we want. So that's just, just kind of setting up uh, the, the whole um, uh, framework that then, you know, I'm trying to, we're trying to develop tools that will apply to anything that kind of fits this general approach to either solving optimization problems or just uh, fixed point iterations for other types of problems. Um, so, uh, and the, the interesting thing about this problem format is that a non-Euclidean uh, type of, of operation comes in very naturally, kind of sneakily, really. It's, it's not wildly non-Euclidean. We're not in a non-linear space. So we still have addition, things like this. But um, uh, I'll, I'll lead you um, gradually to that. So some of the, the main objects that, that we work with um, uh, quite frequently are just the distance function and a projector. All right, so the, the distance to a set is just the, this, the solution to this optimization problem, uh, the value of this optimization problem, and then the projector is just the, the, um, the solution mapping. Um, now, uh, and this, none of this requires any linear structure. So this can be in any, any metric space. Um, and uh, now uh, the, the algorithm that I'll present to you uh, works with a Bregman uh, distance. And this is not a metric. Uh, but just to remind you, the Bregman uh, distance or Bregman divergence is defined this way. It's a, it's a mapping on the two inputs, x1 and x2. And you have some, what I'll call the Bregman potential H. And, um, and it uh, puts these two inputs together in, in this way. Um, it's not symmetric because it depends if you have x1 first and x2 second. That's a, you get a different number for the Bregman divergence than when, when you put x2 first and x1 uh, second. Um, but then you can, you can talk about the, the Bregman distance to a set, which is just then again the, the, the value function of, of this optimization problem with instead of a, a norm here, just the Bregman divergence here. And then the Bregman projector would be the, the solution mapping to that, to that set. And so I'll denote the Bregman projector uh, this way with the H in the, in the superscript to indicate, because that's going to characterize the, it's the Bregman potential uh, characterizes which uh, Bregman projection you're using. So nice properties that we all know uh, about uh, projectors in particular is that if, if a set um, is, is convex and we've got some subset of just now here, this is in quite some generality, just a uniformly convex metric space. Um, if the set's convex, then the projector is, I'll, I'll get to this definition, is, is alpha firmly non-expansive. I'll, I'll define that um, explicitly uh, in a few slides. Um, uh, and that, that's a good property. And also the projector is a singleton. Uh, that's also a nice a desirable property when, when we get to coding and implementing algorithms. 
Um, and these are the, the main properties that you use to prove uh, convergence results uh, in algorithms. But there are a few things you have to be careful about when you move away from a Euclidean uh, setting or a Hilbert space setting is that the projector is not always non-expansive, non-expansive being Lipschitz continuous with, with constant uh, one, um, even when, when the set C is convex. So this, this connection between firm non-expansiveness and non-expansiveness that we get very uh, used to in, in Hilbert space settings does not hold uh, when we're um, in more general metric spaces. And then other things that can happen as we all know, uh, projections on the non-convex sets become multi-valued. If you see here, the projection on this, onto the sphere. Um, so we have to, uh, we have to worry about neighborhoods and things like that as soon as we get to non-convex uh, applications. Um, and so this is just things that can go wrong. Now, a generalization of the projectors is the prox mapping, um, which we all know in the, the, usual, the usual metric prox mapping. Um, uh, this is in a Hadamard space. A Hadamard space um, is a uniformly convex space with, a, with, with these exponents two here. If we're in wilder P uniformly convex spaces, you would have a different exponent up here. Um, but uh, so a, a Hilbert space or something like this. Uh, you can, this is how you would define the, the prox operator uh, for a function f um, with some step length parameter, say lambda, and that's so we're all familiar with that. The Bregman prox you define analogously and just replace the, the metric with the Bregman distance here. Okay. Um, and but it's there's a point that that even even the experts I think myself included uh, sometimes forget about is that we we're also used to thinking about the prox synonymously with the resolvent of of the mapping f uh, of a function f and um, that when you're in a when when the function is non-convex um, the resolvent is a much bigger set than the prox so. Uh, and oftentimes the formulas that we have for a prox uh, uh, in a convex setting, um, we, we use these formulas, but the formula is actually based on the resolvent. Um, and so uh, we have to be careful because um, we implement resolvents and uh, a point on the resolvent might not be a prox point. Um, and so you have to you have to ensure because a, a lot of times when when we formulate algorithms and I'll show you in a second, the the formulation is that the points that we select are actually the prox points. Um, so you have to you have to guarantee that uh, in in your implementation. Uh, so examples of prox that we all know um, for the indicator function it's the projection, uh, and then the Bregman prox is just the Bregman projection. Um, now, so this is back to my point about, about the result. So this is the resolvent of the function f, and the prox is a subset of that in general. Um, and so the resolvent is just defined. The resolvent uh, at a point x is the set of points y such that the identity plus lambda times the subdifferential of y uh, contains x. And the Bregman prox, you can define, you can define the, the Bregman resolvent um, and that would that would look this way, and it's and it's acting instead of having the identity mapping here <clears throat> for for the metric, we have the gradient of the Bregman potential. So I'm presuming here implicitly that my my Bregman potential is smooth. Um, it doesn't have to be smooth, um, but here it is. Uh, so so this is what the Bregman prox, uh, what the Bregman uh, resolvent looks like. And the Bregman prox is just some subset of that. Okay. So back to our mathematical model. Um, again, some uh, proper lower semi-continuous function, a convex uh, proper lower semi-continuous function acting on the second block of variables y, and then the coupling function, which could be non-convex. Okay. Um, and here's the algorithm. Uh, this is a, a semi-Bregman proximal alternating linearized minimization, SB-POM. 
So it's, it's really based on the, the Palm uh, algorithm that, that um, um, Mark and Shom and, and um, Jerome Bolt uh, proposed several years ago. Um, and uh, just to run through this, the things to, to really pay attention to, this, this LK, okay, this is a Lipschitz constant associated with the function, uh, with the coupling function Q. Uh, and since Q is a quadratic, it's, it's not Lipschitz. Um, uh, and also the, the, the constant will depend on where you are respect relative to the blocks of variables, either X or Y. So, so the, these, this constant is, is the sort of the local Lipschitz constant uh, uh, at the point uh, Y, at the, the iterate Y K minus one there, uh, scaled by something here. Okay, um, so the first block of variables we're going to update by computing the Bregman prox of the previous iterate for that block. Now, the, the thing to notice about this, this update step is that it's the prox of a function that itself is changing, this GK. And what the GK is, is uh, we are uh, taking the linearization with respect to the coupling um, uh, at, at the previous point, x k minus one, y k minus one. Um, and, but it's not a full linearization because we're not linearizing the, the main function on the, the x block of variables. So it's certainly, it's, it's a partial linearization, but only with respect to the coupling there. Um, and since this point y is, is moving, uh, this, this function is also, um, this function is changing. Okay, so, so that makes the analysis of this difficult because it's not a prox of a fixed function, it's a prox of a sequence of functions. Um, and and that, that makes things a little bit challenging. The y block of variables, this, this update um, is actually more straightforward. This is uh, just the the prox, now it's a prox of a fixed function, the, the phi function acting on y, the y block, scaled by this penalty parameter rho. Um, and the, but the argument of that is this non-convex, uh, smooth non-convex function of the x block of variables. And we've, we've put in the update that we already uh, computed uh, in, this, in this step. For the y, so so this is fairly straightforward. Although it's you've got a and remember this is a, a convex function, so the prox is 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 fine. This is a very nicely defined thing, except that it's it's acting on a non-convex function of the previous block block of variables. But those that other block in this for this sub problem, it's that block's just a set of parameters. So so this is all this is just a point. Okay, so that's a nice uh, nicely defined step. So the convergence analysis, uh, there's, there's the global convergence analysis and the local convergence analysis, and we'll see how these, these come together. Uh, um, <clears throat> so the, the, the theorem is we're going to look at sequences of the blocks of variables, x, k, y, k. Uh, and we start the algorithm from any initial point. Uh, and so in addition to the structural assumptions that I started off with, we have to add a few extra assumptions. This is the one that I really don't like, um, but it seems standard in the industry that the sequence, that this sequence is bounded. Okay, so you immediately get existence. Uh, they might as well assume existence of cluster points. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, so that's what this, this assumption is all about. Um, it seems to happen quite frequently, but um, anyway, that's, that's the one part of this that, that I'm not so happy with. Um, and then the, now we haven't said what this Bregman potential is going to be, um, uh, but the, the Bregman potential is constructed so that when you look at the Bregman potential minus the coupling function, as a function of x parameterized by the y block of variables, that this thing is convex. Okay, so, so I said that the, the coupling function didn't need to be convex. And in fact, the non-convexity 
of the coupling function is coming from this little q function of x. Um, so even though that's non-convex, um, it's not severely non-convex because we can add this, this potential h to it that is strongly convex and smooth such that this difference, and this is the, this is remember the Lipschitz constant of this, of this, um, such that this thing is convex. So it's, it's, it's putting a bound on, on, on how non-convex we can be in that coupling. And this is what, this type of structure is, uh, was first studied by Heinz Fauschke, Jerome Bolton, Mark Tabul in 2016. And they call functions uh, Q that admit such a function uh, H, they call these uh, SMAD for um, smooth adaptable functions with respect to some, some potential H, okay? So that's the key. That's the key secret to this whole analysis, really. And then we also assume that the, the gradient with respect to x of this coupling function q is locally Lipschitz. So with those additional assumptions, then we can show that uh, all cluster points, which exist because the sequence is bounded, are critical points. And so, so that part, uh, you get global convergence to critical points. Um, and oh uh, well, you get okay. You get you get uh, the, the cluster points are um, critical points. To get convergence, you need the kardike loyosovich property. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this uh, KL property, uh, I think I, I give it explicitly here. <clears throat> this is also kind of the secret ingredient in in, in the in all the analysis that that happens in in, in this style. Uh, it's it's the it's the the um, in German we'd say it's it's the the magical spell that you cast on your analysis to get convergence, but um, <clears throat> uh, but Jerome uh, Aristanelidis and and Adrian Lewis showed that this KL property holds it really generically. So for any semi-algebraic function, you you've got this KL property holding. So it, it's uh, it's a bit of magic, but it's magic that happens quite frequently. So, <clears throat> so you get convergence. So um, just to give you a feeling for, for how the, the proof works, um, the, the, the basic idea, it comes from this, this um, notion of a, of a gradient-like uh, descent sequence. Um, and this comes from, from work that Jean uh, Bolt and Jean Salaf and Mark did uh, in 2009. Um, so looking again at a sequence of variables, both blocks, X and Y together uh, in this Z variable, that, that the sequence is, is sort of, it's, it's a gradient-like descent sequence if it satisfies these three properties. So we're looking at the, the function of those variables being this, and that it, that it satisfies all of these <clears throat> three properties. And then once those three properties are satisfied, that's, that's what they call a gradient-like descent sequence. Um, and the proof is basically you show that under the assumptions uh, that, that we provided that this, the algorithm generates a gradient-like descent sequence. And then that's all you need to get uh, um, that the cluster points are critical points. And then you add the KL assumption. And then that uh, allows you to show that uh, all subsequences, uh, or that the, the sequence is a Cauchy sequence, and then you get convergence. So that's that's the logic of that. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the global convergence. And then to give you a feeling for the the local convergence, we need to rewrite this algorithm as a fixed point algorithm. And so remember, this was the original algorithm. Um, you 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 adjust some the Lipschitz uh, parameter. Uh, L here, then you compute a Bregman prox uh, for the first block of variables. And this Bregman prox is parameterized by a, a sequence of functions that's changing. Um, but the, the second block of variables, this is, this is fairly reasonable. So you shouldn't worry about that. The, the trick is trying to uh, rewrite this uh, in a way that allows us to think of this whole thing as a fixed point iteration. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing to do is get rid of this, this parameter LK. And we're gonna 
uh, replace that with its upper bound, L bar, um, which um, in, 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 uh, in the assumptions, uh, they, they already assumed that, that this Lipschitz constant was bounded above by assuming that the sequence was bounded. Uh, and since, uh, and if the sequence is bounded, then the, under all of the other assumptions that they have, they have locally Lipschitz uh, functions. So there's this upper bound. So, so this is not a, at all a, a, um, a limitation uh, or an extra assumption we have to sneak in here. There, there exists this upper bound. So I'm just replace that with that upper bound. And the performance is gonna be then not optimal, but I don't really care about that. Um, so the equivalent way to write this uh, as a fixed point iteration is the following. So here's my fixed point iteration. It's the, a composition of two operators, which the, the fact that it's two operators is coming from the fact that we're, we're these two blocks of operators. So I'm just gonna put that all together. Uh, and I'm only gonna write this in terms of the first block of variables X. And so the first operator, oops, oh no, my, my PDF just crashed. Sorry, uh, I will reopen that and, um, and come okay. back. No problem. We have some break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, think, you can think about your questions. Uh, sorry. Uh, main PDF here. Uh, so now I need to share my screen again. Um, I'm not seeing, oh, there it is. Yep, I am seeing it. And main, here we go. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the, it's, a, it's just a composition of two fixed mappings. The, the outer one is, this is now a normal prox, a, a, a ordinary uh, Euclidean prox operator uh, of the function f phi here, where f phi is defined this way. What the phi is, the phi, uh, it takes this Bregman potential H and we're gonna subtract from this H uh, just the norm squared. And how that comes about, you just, you just get your hands dirty with it and you, you see that these, these terms sort of pop out. Um, <clears throat> and this is just the, the constant times, I don't know why I put a parenthesis around this, but just constant times this, uh, this phi. So, so this is how the, the Bregman potential kind of sneaks in here and we just uh, make this new objective function F phi and with a step parameter beta over L. <clears throat> and that's some parameter that we can change for beta small enough is, is, is really the statement that we're looking for. Um, and then the second, the inner mapping T2, uh, it, it looks pretty awful but it's really not that bad if you look at all the individual terms, it's just involving a gradient of Q, which we assume Q is um, uh, C1. Um, <clears throat> so this is continuously differentiable. The gradient of phi, well, phi is just given by this and the H was already assumed to be smooth. Um, and so that's fine. Uh, we got a prox of Q of X that was already in there. And that's, this is a prox with a convex function here. That's fine. Uh, so the, really this is, it looks bad, but it's not that bad at all. So that's this block of variables XK, this is a, a precisely equivalent to what we get when we apply this algorithm and only look at the X block, okay? <clears throat> sorry, that's the sorry, sorry, Russell, sorry for interrupting. It should be a, a T2, T1 or T1, T2. I mean, the order. The order is exactly the way I wrote it here. T1, I'm applying T1 to T2 applied to XK minus one. So that so you, you do this one first, because this is the Y, here's the Y variable. Yeah, because my feeling is that the first one is to be simple and the second one is more complicated. Um, I'll show you. Uh, actually, in the in the second part of this, this when I show you how to do these computations, okay. really, we'll see that this isn't so bad. Okay. But okay. I mean, there are just a lot of terms in there. Yeah, with lots of pluses and minuses, but this is just, we're just adding together things that are well-defined, you know, gradients, we can compute these. Yeah, and the procs, it's a, it's a convex proc, so that, that's fine. Everything in there. Um, the only thing we, 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 you really have to worry about this T1 um, because this function, you know, 
it might not be convex. So we have to worry about actually getting the argmin in, in, in the resolvent formula for this. Uh, this guy is convex, that's fine. But, but uh, anyway, it, it gets, this, the T1 is the hard one actually. <clears throat> okay, but, they're, but the nice thing is that these are fixed. They're, they're not changing with the iteration. So this is a fixed point iteration. And then <clears throat> the local analysis goes like this. Um, I'm gonna first show you necessary conditions for uh, R linear convergence. Um, and then the next slide, I'll show you the sufficient conditions. But <clears throat> um, so the additional assumption, <clears throat> I need, well, it's not an additional assumption that, that actually this property holds uh, with the assumptions that we used for the global analysis. But uh, the, the general theory works as follows. This is our fixed point iteration, and it's really based on this guy, the properties of this guy, and the properties of this guy. So, so what we're going to require are that, that this F phi, the subdifferential is submonotone, where submonotone means this, that it satisfies this inequality for uh, X plus and Z in the graph of the subdifferential of F. <clears throat> so implicitly, I'm assuming that F, that F phi is subdifferentially regular. Um, and this, what the z point is, is it's just uh, x minus x plus, where x is a point that I'm applying the resolvent of f phi to. So th this is a very, very complicated way of saying something about the regularity of this function f. Okay, don't get too hung up on all of this, but this submonotonicity. It, this is a generalization of hypomonotonicity, if you're familiar with that, in the study of prox regular functions. Uh, and it's notice that this is this is less than zero, so it's it's not monotonicity that we're that we're used to. So a necessary condition for uh, linear convergence. So if so, let's start off with the assumption that all of the sequences that we generate by our fixed point iteration initialized. Uh, anywhere close enough to the fixed points of that operator. So I'm already assuming that this operator has fixed points, okay? Um, and that will be, I'll, I'll have to assume that. Um, so if, if it holds that for all sequences that I could initialize, this inequality in red holds for some mu less than one, <clears throat> Uh, and so basically it says that the, that the distance of the next iterate to the set of fixed points is less than, uh, it's, it's like a contraction with respect to the set of fixed points. Um, then the sequence converges R linearly to a point in uh, fixed T. So the, 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 the surprising thing here should be that we actually get convergence to a point with a rate that's given by this contraction scaling or contraction constant here. That, that's probably not so, uh, shouldn't be so surprising. But what is surprising, however, is that also when this holds on a neighborhood of the fixed points, you have this inequality too. And what this inequality is, is metric subregularity uh, in honor of Sen. Um, this is the key uh, ingredient uh, for uh, any kind of rated convergence uh, of fixed point iterations. And so it's, this is metric subregularity, which is um, a type of Lipschitz continuity of the inverse uh, mapping of T. Okay, and, the, and the, the rate of metric subregularity is related to this rate, uh, this contraction constant here in this, in this fashion. Yeah. So this is necessary if any, if, if you want your sequence to be R linearly convergent, um, then you must have metric subregularity, linear metric subregularity. Okay. Um, so now to sufficient conditions. Uh, again, same, same, uh, same assumptions about um, regularity of this F phi. If, on the other hand, if we have metric subregularity, equation two or inequality two on some neighborhood of the set of fixed points uh, with constant mu bar, 
uh, being less than one over two epsilon, where epsilon is this constant. And I'll, I'll explain where this constant's coming from in a second, but the beta, the beta bar here is, is the, uh, it's, it's related to this, this step length that we get to choose, okay? So, so if it's, so it's, it's, this constant is bounded above by one over two epsilon where the epsilon is this. Uh, LR is the Lipschitz constant of the inner operator T2. Then from any, uh, from any iterate, so now from the global analysis, we know that the iterates converge to the fixed points, right? That's that we get from the, the global analysis from any starting point. So uh, from any iterate, once we enter this, this region of the, the, the local neighborhood of the fixed points, then the algorithm is at least R linearly convergent with a rate given by, by this, where the, the epsilon constant is here and the mu bar is there. So that's the rate of local linear convergence. <clears throat> um, and if, in, if moreover, if this uh, function that was on the first block of variables x is convex, then whenever we have uh, this uh, metric subregularity with some constant mu bar, now just any constant mu bar, uh, notice here I had to have mu bar small enough. If f is convex, then as long as we have this inequality two for some, um, uh, for some constant, then for all beta small enough, the iterates converge eventually at least R linearly. <clears throat> so, um, and uh, if the set of fixed points relative to the aff affine hull of the iterates is, is isolated, then we get Q linear convergence. And the, the difference between Q linear and R linear convergence is that Q linear convergence allows you to get a posteriori error estimates uh, uh, of the iterates to, the, to their limit. Uh, and our linear convergence doesn't allow you to do that. So, so the proof of this relies on metric subregularity. That's the first uh, thing you need. And so the, this submonotonicity assumption on the subdifferential of F phi, this is related to actually pointwise alpha firm non-expansiveness. I mentioned this um, uh, a few slides earlier. And what that is, is exactly this uh, inequality. So it means that the that the whole fixed point mapping is satisfies this inequality where x plus is is in the image of this mapping. It could be multi-valued because <clears throat> we're in general non-convex. And if you uh, you if you've seen a talk from me, you've seen this inequality before. But if you get rid of this last term, this one over alpha one minus alpha over alpha, what it looks like is Lipschitz. It's pointwise Lipschitz continuity with a Lipschitz constant one plus epsilon, but then you, it's a little bit stronger than that because you're subtracting off this this extra term here. So that's what pointwise almost alpha firm non-expansiveness means. The almost is in there because you've got this epsilon here uh, that's that's making this constant up front here a little bit bigger than one. Okay, and the whole result then follows just from these two properties, and it's quite easy uh, once you get these two. It's just it's a few lines. So again, um, this this gives us an error bound if we have in fact Q linear convergence. And so now we also have that the fixed points are critical points. Uh, so the the, the critical points uh, of the now, now I'm trying to take it back to the optimization problem that, that we wanted to solve at the very beginning. <clears throat> the, the critical points of that are characterized this way. So this is just the first order optimality criterion. Um, and as long as that the beta um, in my reformulation of things, as long as this beta is small enough, then the fixed points of the fixed point iteration Will be a subset of these critical points, and and this uh, this inclusion holds with equality whenever the prox of this guy is exactly this resolvent. In general, the prox is a subset of that, so that's why we would get just just this inclusion here. But if the prox is e equivalent to, to the resolvent, um, then 
then we have equality between the fixed points of our of our operator and critical points of the optimization problem that we we're interested in solving. So um, just some numerical results. I've implemented all of this in my prox toolbox, uh, but the my implementation for this problem is not in the general release yet. That should be included uh, eventually. Um, <clears throat> we're going to look at problems where the, they're going to differ by the choice of this leading function f. <clears throat> and so we'll take the L2 norm, L1 norm, and then the L0 norm that Patrick was talking about in the previous talk. Uh, the, uh, the function acting on the, the Y block of variables will take as just the L1 uh, norm. The Bregman potential is going to be a, a quartic power uh, of, the, uh, of the two norm plus the two norm here. So this is the one that, that works out. It's, it's not the only one that you could use, but it's the one that, that we can get results for. Um, and what, the, what the, this little q function was, it's just some general quadratic. And we just randomly generated uh, these matrices A, and don't worry about whether or not these A's are uh, symmetric positive definite or anything like that. Um, so, so these are the, the different cases. So the main difference is, is in what this, this lead function f is. So for the, the smooth L2 case, um, then we can, we've got explicit, uh, explicit representations for these procs, the procs of this. Uh, and here, the, so it's t times xj, the jth element of x, where t is the positive root of this cubic polynomial here. Um, and the cubic is coming from the fact that our, our Bregman potential is a quartic power. So um, you that's why you have to be careful about not choosing too wild uh, a Bregman potential because you'll, you'll have to solve some sort of, find the roots of some polynomial that could be complicated. Uh, so, but we get an explicit expression for this prox mapping uh, and it's, uh, it's the first order optimality criteria for this, this problem down here. That's how you compute that. And what we get uh, is, again, we get global convergence, eventual linear convergence. That's what this graph is showing. This is the log and the change of the iterates. And this is exactly what we predicted. This is the objective function. You see what the objective function is doing. Um, so great. Uh, uh, still a convex function, but non-smooth. And again, it again becomes you know, challenging to compute this prox uh, explicitly, but we just take the first order optimality criteria for this problem, and that gives us uh, the problem of finding the roots of this cubic polynomial. And so we can then explicitly write down what the prox is here. And what the algorithm gets here is actually the algorithm terminates finitely for this problem uh, after 26 iterations. Um, so it's linear convergence is just an upper bound. It could converge more quickly than that. <clears throat> and uh, so great. Uh, what happens when we choose a non-convex function? And here, uh, again, the challenge is in computing this prox. Same, same story. We get to find the roots of the cubic uh, and we get that explicitly. And so here, uh, here's where it's very nice because Mark and Shoham's theory says you will converge to a critical point. They don't say how long you might have to wait because there's no complexity on that. So we wait long enough and, and to look at the change in the iterates, it's also non-monotone with respect to the iterates. Uh, they're wiggling around a lot, but eventually we hit it. We get in the neighborhood. The objective function's coming down. That's nice. And then right around 10 to the a little bit bigger than 10 to the two in the objective function value, uh, we hit the, the region of, of local linear convergence. And that's what that's showing. And there we go. Uh, and so the theory gives the, the complete picture of this. Um, uh, so I will stop there and give some of the references. The, the, the paper that this is based on is not even on archive yet. It, it should be by February, um, uh, the, the revisions are, are um, now in my uh, inbox and I need to uh, work on that. But 
the papers that that are based on are all are all here. Uh, this is the work with Jerome and and uh, Jean and Marc on the global analysis here. Uh, this is more general nonlinear spaces, uh, all this kind of analysis there. Uh, but the main the main uh, papers where we show necessity of metric subregularity are in this paper, and then the quantitative convergence analysis with the sufficient conditions are in this paper. So, thanks. Thank you, Russell, for your very nice talk. Uh, now it's time for discussions. Anyone, if you have uh, any question or comment, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, ask Russell. I have one question. Um, when you update this Bregman potential, this to me, this looks very complicated. Uh, is there a motivation? Is there a way of understanding where this comes from, why we should do it? Yeah, it's coming from this. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this property is because, because they're able to sneak in convexity by, by choosing this, this H potential, this, this Bregman potential uh, well enough <clears throat> that the analysis then, um, even though, yes, we have a non-convex problem, we're adding this, this and, and you notice that, the, that the, the potential that we chose, H, let me see if I can show you, uh, it's, it's, it's very convex. Uh, um, it's, it's quadratic down to, you know, so you've got this quadratic convexity near zero, and then a quartic uh, convexity kind of away from zero. So this is, this is a really nice potential. And, and you see then then that, that kills whatever non-convexity is coming in from the coupling function Q. But would it be possible for an algorithm to detect that while it's running? Because I mean, now you choose a, an H because you know what the problem is and so on and so on. But uh, let's say you are running an algorithm like you, you implement it for MATLAB or something and somebody uses it. Is that possible then? Uh, then I would say the difficulty is in this step, computing the procs. But you know, it's, it's funny you should bring this up because um, I've been working with, I worked with Matt on a symbolic prox computer. Um, but the, the issue is that this prox depends explicitly on your choice for H, right? And you, ha you have to, uh, it, it comes in right there. And so if you've got an algorithm that kind of detects, oh, okay, we, we got a kind of non-convexity, we need to bump something into a convex term. We, you'd have to find a way for the computer to choose a Bregman potential that would satisfy this SMAD property that, that Mark requires. But the potential has to be such that we can still then, if symbolically, compute this prox mapping. And that's a, a very automatic algorithm. Um, I, I could imagine so many ways that that could go wrong, but that would be really fun. I mean, I would love actually to, to implement one algorithm that, that, that actually symbolically computes the prox and implements that, that would be fun. Okay. Uh, Russell, uh, hello. Uh, uh, Jordi, yes. Huh. Hello, Russell. Hi. Hi. Yeah, it, it, for this mad property, this H function, this Bregman potential, does it have to be some kind of Legendre function? It has some list of properties. So that is what I remember yes. I saw in this paper of uh, uh, Heinz Bauschke, De yeah. Bull and yeah, so exactly. my, uh, will it be so easy to find functions with, actually they are trying to avoid the uh, Lipschitz gradient property and uh, Right. I don't know. It, 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 will it be so easy to construct these Bregman potentials that you require and all these good things will happen and still having the Legendre properties? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's sort of like the procs. Um, 
you know, the, the prox mapping is a, is a hugely powerful tool that's showing up in all kinds of first order methods. But if you think about it, the number of functions that we know how to explicitly compute the prox for is very small. Mm. Yeah. And I think it yeah. would be, it's similar this way, um, that, that the, the choices of H that will make everything work nicely, uh, it's pretty limited, but it covers mm. a whole lot of problems that, I mean, this, with this quadratic format, um, that, that covers an awful lot of problems already. So, okay. But I think you're right. <laughs> oh, I just, okay. I'm also one of this, uh, trying to do something with removing Lipschitz gradient uh, yeah. property. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, as, as we try to get to more and more general kinds of functions, they're just, there are always more ways that we can think of that would, would violate the, the, uh, the conditions that we impose than, than the ones that work. Um, so, yeah, have to be careful. Okay, so thanks. Okay, thanks. thanks. Uh, any other question or comment? Um, maybe I, I have uh, one question. So um, also um, for the global conversion, you need uh, the, the assumption that the, um, the objective function satisfy KL property, right? Kurikalo specific property. Yeah. Uh, and we know that if the if the objective function uh, satisfy the KL property with the exponent, the exponent less than one half, then we also have a linear conversion. Yep. And so, can you uh, can you comment on the connection in in that case in the about the, the linear conversion in that case with with the local linear conversion in your case? Yes. Um... Jérôme and um, Aris Danalidis showed in their 2010 uh, TAMS paper uh, that uh, the KL property implies metric regularity, re metric regularity, not metric subregularity, metric regularity. So um, the metric subregularity that I require is a weaker assumption than the, than assuming that the KL property holds. Uh, if, if the KL property holds with constant one half. Um, yeah, so, yeah. so if so, certainly if the KL property holds with constant one half, then the local analysis uh, you could you could adjust the local analysis yeah. um, to to use that and show local linear convergence. Um, but if uh, if you only have metric subregularity, um, I don't believe that it's true that you have a KL type property. But I'm sure you've got a general. You, I'm sure you would have a generalization of a type of KL. Okay. And uh, to op to obtain the, that the, the the operator is uh, almost firmly no offensive. You you don't need the uh, I know almost uh, yeah almost average or almost firmly no offensive. Um. More yes, so that's that's coming from the submonotonicity assumption on on the F because where where do I do this um, because submonotonicity of that um, implies that that the whole operator then is almost alpha firmly known. Okay, okay, but in 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 the case of global conversion, you don't need the, the assumption like that, right? No, yeah, you you don't need that. For the global, um, so and that's kind of interesting. Um, I think it's just a different way of approaching it that you know relies on this gradient-like descent sequence. Yes, uh, I think, and and I, I haven't seen anywhere where somebody is, has looked at at that kind of connection, but that could be interesting to see what. Almost yeah, yeah. What is what is the the. the... The, yeah. the intuition behind, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, uh, any other question or comment, please? Uh, if, if not, so uh, let. Ah, uh, 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 yes. There, there is. Uh, 
Facebook Oops, you muted yeah. 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 Sorry Hi Russell, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Yeah, uh, I just wondering uh, that uh, so you need the um, uh, matrix uh, sub uh, separability for uh, to get the linear convergence. So how about if we replace uh, this condition by a holder uh, regularity or holder separability? Yeah, yeah. Um, in a let's see. Um, uh, in a, in a sorry, you have muted. Russell, uh, am I am I muted now? No, 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 no. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, uh, we sh uh, in a paper with um, uh, let's see, I I might have even been in this paper. Uh, we showed uh, it was mostly Tao who did this. He showed that um, that the Hulda regularity type conditions, um, and this is a Dominicus Noll has has used this and and Soubiran, um, that those conditions um, imply they they imply metric subregularity together with. Um, this almost alpha firm non-expansiveness. So, so when you when you use the Hulda technology, um, it's it's a slightly different reorganization of the of the key properties. But uh, Tao was able to show, and I think it was in it was in this paper that uh, those properties uh, imply imply the the conditions that we have. Also, I. I think in this paper we we dealt explicitly with the type of Hulda regularity that Dominicus used um, in the context of feasibility. So we could show an equivalence of those things. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank Russell. Um, th there is a question from Guin. Uh, hi Russell, thanks for the nice talk. <laughs> Uh, I just have uh, two simple questions. And the first one is actually, I remember you mentioned that you were not uh, very happy with the boundaries condition for your sequence, right? So is, yeah. it, uh, is it can be easily implied by, for example, some coercive conditions, which you impose on this coupling function over there? Yeah, yeah, De definitely if, if you have coercive functions. Um... Uh, and uh, you know, and honestly, I, I can't even um, think of a of an instance where where the iterates wouldn't be bounded. But it, in my experience, what what happens is that if you drop, okay, there there are two assumptions like this that appear frequently in, in papers in this direction. Either they assume that the sequence is bounded, or they assume that the functions that they're minimizing are Lipschitz gradient have Lipschitz gradients. The Lipschitz gradients give them the bounded sequences. And if and in this approach, since they're uh, as Joy Deep was saying, they're getting rid of the assumption of Lipschitz gradients, then they have to uh, impose boundedness of the sequences. I see. So there's a compromise uh, because of the exactly. I see. And, uh, and that's because because that's the only way I've seen I, I when I see the the assumption of Lipschitz gradients, it's usually in, uh, imposed in order to get boundedness of the sequence. Okay. Uh, then my second question, uh, first of all, thanks for the answer. Sam. My second question would be, um, do you think it would be, I mean, the algorithm can be applied, for example, to the phase retrieval constraints? Because that would be something which of interest, I think, because now you did the case for the cardinality case, the L1 and the gradient of square. So yeah. would this be, can be applied to uh, some sort of phase retrieval cases or I'm just wondering? About yes. Um, the only thing, so down here, mm -hmm. uh, this phi then would be, uh, I think here we would, it would just be zero. 
uh, right? Um, because we would be, this is our model, the physics model here. Uh, and then basically if we require y to be zero, so the indicator function of zero, <laughs> nice convex set, great. Mm -hmm. um, the only problem with that is that now we would have a quartic in X. Right. And, and for numerical reasons, that's just a really slow, that's because it smooths out everything near zero. Um, and that causes uh, the algorithms to be really slow. Um, so what I would do, and I've asked Mark and Shom about this, and Mark is skeptical, uh, and it gets back to this function h. I want to, on this inner function, I want to put a, like a one half power or something close to it. Um, so that I can make that inner part as close to just having power one, so that I ultimately only have a power two on the X variables. And, but the trade, then you have to find the H, the Bregman potential that can work with that. And Mark um, is, is skeptical that you, because you have to find this H for which then you can compute the Bregman prox. <laughs> And that's not trivial, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, it's a challenge, but that's exactly what I would love to do. Uh, my idea is just make this to like a power one half or some, some, something that gets close to that. And then this, this objective function would be very, very close to the, to the algorithms that in a feasibility framework work, we know those work really well. <laughs> and, and that would be great because then we'd have a global, global and local analysis. I see. Thanks for that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Wade. Uh, and now, uh, if there, there is no more questions, uh, let's thank Russell for the keynote talk. And uh, now we will. Uh,